Okay, uh, so um, today we are joined by Sarah Carls. Hello, Sarah. Hi. Uh, and we will talk about uh, the project that she won a special mention for uh, at Lila uh, Landes International Landscape Award this year. And it is a private garden. And uh, also, Sarah will soon receive this beautiful award that just came. And you will receive it soon uh, by post. <laughs> so this is now kind of digital handing over but you will receive it later Thank you. <laughs> um, probably uh, the visitors of Lendezin already know Sarah because she already won uh, one recognition in 2021 uh, it was a special jury prize for her project Arsenal Oasis uh, in Tbilisi, Georgia, where Sarah currently is. Uh, so I won't introduce her uh, again in detail, just to, uh, just to say maybe that she is an American landscape architect, uh, educated in the United States, and then went to live and work in Tbilisi, Georgia. Uh, so uh, probably I will paste the link to the old video from two years ago somewhere around uh, uh, on YouTube and on, on the website. Uh, so I, will, I would start, uh, Sarah, with uh, the, the project Arsenal Oasis. Uh, what was the evolution of the project, where it is now, what happened and so on. Please. Yeah, so at, for the, the uh, BBC Architecture Biennial, we had a commission to, to, uh, t to create some kind of public space um, that was an idea like compensating for a lot of the um, unregulated development in BBC in the 90s um, after the, uh, Georgia got independence. And so uh, we thought about creating a kind of prototype of a recompensatory space um, that also was bringing back the actual ecology, the urban ecology of the city, uh, because there's also a campaign now to kind of uh, green the city, but it's mostly with a sort of palette of decorative plants that are being imported from Turkey or Italy or wherever. So we're like, why don't we bring let's let's unearth the ecology that is uh under the under the concrete in Tbilisi and the uh, site we found was um a former army base in of Labari uh called Ars the, was the old arsenal and there uh during the pandemic I discovered with a friend that there's a broken water supply line that used to serve this army base and it's created a wetland. And so the idea was to kind of play with this broken pipe as a, like looking at how, you know, larger infrastructural systems can be kind of hacked or spliced or tapped into to create novel ecosystems and spaces and places and, and sort of just to take that, take that little bit of energy or material and see what you can, invent with that and um and so there's these ideas of like kind of a surplus that can you know be mutable and can create uh, all kinds of new things um and because this area was not uh no one's really paying attention to it it's a bit of a wasteland even though it's in the middle of the city we were able to bring out a bulldozer and remove concrete and create a series of ponds and um kind of different excavations on the site and since then it's really it really changes and I, I like to call it the wild child because um we can try to do some things with it but then always something happens like there's a fire which burned part of it uh sometimes there's illegal dumping along the road which changes the course of this water and most of the time when I go visit I'm concerned that <laughs> someone will have turned off the water um you know, which is what we would have done in Los Angeles because, you know, it would be bad to let the water run. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, and other people have started, you know, um, improvising there. There's like a table and chairs now and somebody painted a bunch of rocks blue. I mean, it's open. <laughs> so it's a kind of, I don't know, maybe this is ecological graffiti, we could call it. I, just reclamation in that way. So are you keeping track of the, the, all the changes and the interactions that people have with this public space? We haven't been keeping track in an organized way, but I do think there's, because of all the, the photographs and the notes that we've taken, that maybe, maybe in a year or two we'd actually put something together that's a little more organized and comprehensive to track those changes. One of the things we really wish we'd done 
If, uh, is to have uh, asked a local ecologist to do a transect or some kind of inventory of the species that are there and um, and just see in terms of, you know, not only herbaceous and woody species, but amphibians, reptiles, birds. Um, there's also, there's still people who are bringing their herds of sheep and cows through it. So there's herbivory of different kinds that it's always, yeah, it's an open system. Mm, mm. <laughs> yeah. Uh, do you have some recent, maybe one or two images or whatever, if you have something uh, that you can just quickly and then we dive into the Betania project? It's, uh, yeah, I mean, I could prob- probably share this um, this drone image. Um, this is a collection of this is a collection of drone drone images from the installation until uh, about a year ago. So let's look at that. Um, And this is on our Substack, uh, which is ruderal.substack.com. You can subscribe or not subscribe, but the Substack is where we keep track of kind of the the day-to-day stuff that maybe we don't necessarily publish, or sometimes it's interviews with people that I think are doing really great things and I would kind of want to bring into the community um, who are people who are thinking about similar things. So this is Basically. the... Basically, yeah, the, back, the backstage of Ruderal. <laughs> yeah, it's the B-sides, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the B-sides, yes. The B-sides. Uh, well, I, I think uh, more offices should uh, do something like that. It's really interesting to see, you know, all the process and, you know, yeah. how it unfolds. It's a great and, outlet and I, uh-huh. you know, because I, I wasn't an academic, I just, you know, there was so much pressure to make everything, write everything perfectly and situate and contextualize and cite my sources. And I was like, you know, I like, I need to kind of, sometimes you need to just get things resolved a little bit, just a little bit and get them, you know, online or whatever, um, but not like strip the bolt as it were and take two years to write something. So yeah, this, it's a good this, intermediate this should step. Be, it should be the front side <laughs> of any yeah, office uh, website, you know, because also the clients can get, you know, some kind of insight into what's happening and they can better understand yeah. what we do. So the, the yeah, and to be honest, this is like this is the practice. Yeah. Right? <laughs> this Great. is the practice. So um, I'll stop sharing. And so today, talking about Batania, one of the reasons um, I got I got back into looking at the project this weekend is that I wanted to talk more about the influences um, and re- then sort of references that the project takes on. Um, Because when I talked about it a week ago, I was kind of more straightforward about like this and this. So this time I want to talk more about the sources. So always about sources, water sources. (laughs) Okay, let's try. Let's try to share the screen. So Britannia Forest Garden. This was an updated plan. Uh, And so I'll talk about some of the origins of this project Um, and how I was thinking about it, things that maybe a, a few, I don't know, this is almost 10 years ago, I visited the landscape laboratory with uh, Roland Gustafsson and Alnarp. Um, and this, many of you might know this, but it's a series of test, kind of test forestry plots that are looking at um, composition, uh, species composition, species interaction, aesthetics, light, um, space, uh, so this, you know, this is like, a, <laughs> this place really shook, shook me. Um, and I thought, you know, I can't wait to do some things like this. So this is an initial um, reference to the idea of like creating forest gardens where um, it's about, it's about these spaces, uh, the light, um, and really focusing on trees, um, trees and relationships of trees and understory. Um rather than kind of traditional uh, ways of looking at maybe spatial organization in a garden. So another, um, so from that, uh, I came back to the, came back to the States. I was assigned a seminar uh, and I decided to focus this on the idea of silviculture and a broader interpretation of silviculture, which is the, uh, how forests are depicted in culture throughout, I mean, whether it's poetry, film, literature, science, technology. Um, 
So in this seminar, I had a really great group of students who created, um, basically looked into different types of representations of forests and then created dioramas of these types of forests. So for there's forest and film, um, this one in the sort of the top, top row with a sort of ghosted image is the, um, is an experiment in how forests are rendered. And the conceit of the whole project was that there would be a, uh, that, that in this axonometric, that there's an interpretive center for an imaginary forest where all of these projects are actually built um, and the forests are grown. But of course, this is just conceptual art. So there really wasn't a forest uh, <laughs> and like an analogous uh, project to the landscape laboratory, but uh, it was ima- it was imagined as such, and um, this somehow got me into trouble with uh, my leadership because this person was afraid that people would actually think that at o- the Ohio State University that we had a landscape laboratory, and what's interesting is that's actually come true. Now there are <coughs> forced. Well, there, now there is a forest garden laboratory and various other meadow experiments that are going on um, at the same location, which is called Waterman Farm. So that's, that's another topic for another day. But, uh, you know, my, my theory is often like fake the news until you make the news. And uh, so this work of this is called the Elisina Lazy Bee Experimental Forest, and it was named after um, the first woman who got a master in landscape architecture from Ohio State. So another influence on the project. Let's see. Do I want to go forward or not? Oh, okay. Here we go. Um, so in Georgia, also over the years, I've been traveling, hiking, exploring, and documenting different uh, textures, spaces, and conditions within Georgian forests. A lot of the Georgian forests are fairly young. Um, you know, there was a lot of, there's definitely been long, a lot of periods of logging, um, and basically use a, f- a forest for fuel. But uh, I've just been out there like looking at spaces and colors and textures and uh, kind of building up a library of these elements that we then try to work with in our practice. Uh, another aspect of the practice is to bring back the um, endemic species, Caucasian endemic species. and. Uh, so this we've walked on a large scale on the Tbilisi urban forest, um, and the Batani forest garden is really a small scale experiment in bringing in that um, <clears throat> diversity, the biodiversity of Georgian endemic species, and the aesthetics, and seeing kind of where that where that might go. And again, the as as Georgia is kind of becoming, growing its middle class, suburbs are developing. Most people are using a kind of really simple palette of decorative plants, lawn, you know, blue spruce, yellow thuya, like red maple kind of stuff. And we we want to really present uh, an alternative to that uh, because obviously there's a great depth to it. And the other aspect is that it can be a economic... um, kind of a rural economy. There are not a lot of professional nurseries in Georgia. Um, And then for the Batania project, we found uh, a really great, this actually, the project started with, by when I met this local um, nursery guy named Malkhazi, and um, he took me for a tour around his his nursery, which is also at the same elevation as Batani, as the Batania Garden, so I really wanted to work on a project uh, with him and his and his crew. So, so yeah, a number of influences. Um, also, this um, what my friend Adrian Kartacek described as Georgia's impasto landscape. The um, these like textured open spaces, like as if it you know painted with a palette knife. And these strong contrasts between light and dark and space. <clears throat> this is in the area just just past where uh, that previous uh, nursery is. This is in Munglisi in the Al Gati Valley. Uh, other elements that are integrated into Batani are these old precast stairs that are found all all over. Uh, so in the Soviet. Con- you know, construction system, they had a lot of precast elements. And so you'll find these fragments all around. Sometimes people just, you know, took them as surplus and 
with some friends, they put together stairways uh, to get to different places, whether it's to cemeteries, to cool drinking spots. Uh, the one on the the lower left is a cableway station in Borjomi. So that this kind of like bare staircase is a it's a strong visual um, cue, I would say, throughout throughout Georgia. Another influence on the project is the work of A.E. Bai, um, who was probably the f first landscape architect that I was like, okay, I want to do that. Um, and he created the, um, this is the Soros, um, <clears throat> Soros landscape where he really just did some grading. He just went out there with a the bulldozer and the idea was to create a, a kind of subtly figured topography that would change throughout the season and basically doing doing a lot of grading to make it look like not much, but then to create uh, a lot of shadow and um, texture and depth. And now my dog is barking. I hate this. Okay. <laughs> Another aspect of his work are these thickets um, and the sound of strong shadows of the winter. So here's our location. It's a very small garden um, with that kind of thick forest um, and open meadow. And when we first got there, they'd been mowing the meadow and they wanted a, I think they wanted like a Pian Adolf kind of um, perennial garden. And I said, well, maybe we can, we could get you something that could be a bit more interesting, just different. Um, so you can see this kind of slightly figured terrain that's from old cow paths. So this was really just old pasture land that's been subdivided. It's about uh, half an hour from Tbilisi um, and pretty high up in elevation in an area called uh, Kujori, which has been a climate resort for a very long time. Stalin had a house in Kujori. This is the surroundings. Um, again, this kind of young hornbeam and beech forest uh, with a really robust understory with a lot of diversity. Uh, so there's hazelnut, there's ash, um, there's a shindy, which is like a dogwood. Um, so uh, everybody's there, everyone's in the forest and old logging roads. Also the, um, has wonderful ravines, um, which are very thickly forested. And again, this wonderful quality of the shadows uh, cast. And this is, um, this is the view more or less from the, from the house looking out onto that slope. And you can see this kind of shadows that are cast down onto that slope. And I thought this would be a, an important thing to utilize and as a phenomenon. And here's looking out to the sort of, this is the middle and, and background. Uh, again, that very textured forest landscape with the sort of patchiness um, and really incredible seasonal change. So overall, like we have a really great situation. Um, we're working in a really small scale, which is um, not something we do that much. Um, we're usually planning larger spaces. Um, we also had a tiny budget um, and it was a collaboration between us and the, and the homeowner, uh, Vano Snilashvili, who's um, he's an architect um, who works, has worked in Korea and in Lithuania and Georgia, um, and his wife. Um, so, but we were kind of mostly driving, driving the process. Um, we did a bit of work in the field, just testing things out, how, how would things look? Um, from inside, how would the proportions work? And um, creating drawings on site. I have to edit out my dog. Hey, you be quiet. Another influence on the project of Georgian, these Georgian painters, Elena Akhvaladiani, um, who really creates a kind of tableau that moves um, up in the picture plane. Um, sort of brings the perspective forward, and there's always a lot of activity um, in that, um, and diversity of landscape within the picture plane. Another um, 
artists from the same period, a Georgian painter, David Kakabadze, doing a kind of similar thing, um, kind of playing with the geometry of cultured landscapes and wild landscapes. So we came up with a couple of schemes based on those a uh, number of those influences. Uh, the first one is the was to create a wall that would cast a really strong shadow, like a sort of slice across. Um, the one in the middle is kind of the winner. <laughs> um, and the one on the far right was a much softer intervention that would be a kind of figured, um, subtly figured stair, or what we call the disfigured bath eventually, <laughs> um, which would just be a series of small stair chunks. Um, and this this one on the, the far right was a kind of it's tuned more to sort of adventure of um, the couple's daughter, who's about three years old now. Um, but the one we settled on was this half and half, just to keep it really, really simple. Half forest, half meadow. So we did this project in about a week. <laughs> Um, and we hired our friend George Kobaya and uh, Elena Gomeliori to uh, document this project. They um, came with us to the day when they extracted the trees. And uh, one of our staff members, uh, Iveta Chikwadze, did a series of drawings of the different buds so that we could identify the trees because they just came on a truck <laughs> without any sort of tags. Um, so this, and then we had to, you know, sort them out again. So this is also uh, because uh, our staff is for the most part architects um, and there's no landscape architecture training in Georgia. So this is a sort of learning as you're working um, about the differences in, um, sapling morphology. These are some drawings also by Iveta. Um, one of the ideas in this Miyawaki forest patch was to create more vertical difference, sort of heterogeneity over time. Um, so we're starting with trees that are a little bit taller than most uh, Miyawaki patches. Um, with the, uh, with the notion of like coppicing some of them to keep some of them low, letting some of them grow higher, um, and then editing out over time, like if some die to just do a kind of chop and drop, which, you know, rather than taking those uh, dead trees out. Um, so yeah, <laughs> there might be some, uh, you know, what's the word? Uh, what is it called when you, I don't know, I'll come back to that. <laughs> <laughs> the way that sometimes when you when you drop um, shrubs, right, they can root. I'll remember that term in a bit. Um, so here's the section. Um, really simple. The idea to bridge the house and kind of create the domestic scale of that large forest beyond um, through this uh, the stair that divides. The the other interesting part about the stair is that. By dividing that patch, it will uh, allow in more edge species, uh, which is something that's uh, not necessarily used in a typical Miyawaki forest planting, where they're sort of just, they just kind of plant them all in a dense circle. So we have <clears throat> a nice family of species. Uh, we have Acer campestri, Carpinus orientalis, Eltis orientalis, uh, Corlys abeliana, which is the hazel, which would get coppiced. Fagus um, orientalis is, is tall. That's also part of the um, hedge that wraps around the site. Uh, we had a couple apple, wild apple. Um, there's a lot of apple that's in the, in the pasture, so kind of echo of that. Um, this one, uh, this prunus is a really um, important one locally, which they call tremali. It's used in, to create a really um, well-known Georgian uh, sauce, plum sauce. Um, and it has a really great early bloom. Uh, Quercus iberica, which is our local oak. The tilia, which has a really beautiful red um, 
red twigs in the early spring. Um, we had some ulmus and then this Pinus sosnovsky. And there's two really large Pinus sosnovskys um, on the site. And so we planted another one as a kind of um, echo of those. Oops. Well, this is planting day. Um, and on this crew, we had, uh, I don't know, something like six languages. We had English, Ukrainian, Armenian, Russian, Azeri, and Georgian on this crew. So it was a, it was a really good day. This is early spring. So you can see the, the soil is really cinnamonic. Um, not a ton of organic matter in it at this time, but we're going to um, get the soil analyzed over the next few years to see what changes. It was early summer, sort of like a veil of vegetation. Uh, the trees, you know, these saplings are still fairly stressed out, I would say. And in this photo, you can also see that nice uh, figuration of the, the old cow paths. Um, in some of the earlier versions of this project, I really wanted to do something that was much more intense in terms of earthwork. And I'm Ben Hackenberger, my colleague, convinced me that we're doing enough. <laughs> so this is always a process of like throwing everything at a, at, a, at a site and then removing. It's like, you know, take one accessory off when you leave the house, right? Um, here we are with it. It's irrigated. Um, <clears throat> and we had some problems with uh, too much irrigation that was landing at the bottom of the hill. Also, there's, there is a kind of low wet spot. There's almost a perched wetland in this subdivision and the person who originally cited this house maybe wasn't so cognizant of that. <laughs> so, so yeah, there's quite a, quite a low wet spot and we've had to adjust the irrigation. We lost a few trees, uh, mostly beach due to the overwatering. Um, this is like mid, when was this? One of these is from uh, late July and another is from September. And you can really see how much this herbal um, underlayer is developing that's quite different than the meadow alongside. We did a green mulch. We like seeded it with a bunch of stuff in a mystery pack from the hardware store, um, which turned out to be a lot of radish, uh, wild radish, which um, may, be, <laughs> may have cursed the project to an extent. Um, and then uh, the homeowner also found, you know, like, seeded it with some things that she bought in Copenhagen. So, you know, there's no rules, really. Just grow whatever, whatever survives. Um, and there's also one of the great aspects of this, of this location and this project is that you have these incredible um, changes in atmosphere. And I'm really excited to see how this project reads um, as as the different moisture conditions happen and light conditions. So the stair, which is, you know, just the simple poured concrete stair and didn't turn out to be so simple for the crew that built it, <laughs> has been, um, it's, it's been used in a lot of different media productions, advertising, like fashion. It immediately kind of took off as a, um, as a place, as a place to, I don't know, promote products and, um, so I'm interested to see how many, like, what other kinds of narratives emerge from this garden. And here's the late summer. Um, so I think the the view on the left really shows what what I was thinking when I was first sitting. I was sitting in that chair. Um, maybe it was, yeah, more than a year ago, and sketching um, sort of within that frame to think about, you know, how can we make make a composition that is really rich and detailed but with a really minimum amount of moves and there's our that's the Sosnovsky pine that big that big red monster <laughs> anyway that's the Batani Forest Garden do you have some questions do you have some questions Ash great First, you know, because you are in exotic uh, Georgia, at least uh, yeah. from our perspective, uh, will, it, will it get like 
snowy, white during the winter. This is like completely. Yeah, it got. Batania got like almost a meter of snow last year. And so that's. We. George Kolbaya is um, taking photos every um, season of the. To see. So I'm, yeah, very excited about winter and shadows. I really appreciate uh, why, because you, you left, there's no path to lead, leading to the stairs and no path going, moving on. You know, it's just yeah. like a su suggestion. So I, I really, this is not a question, it's just a comment. So I really appreciate this because it gives it a kind of a isolated, ob objectified, some kind of a sculptural value. Were, were you after that or maybe I, I read it wrong? No, definitely. I mean, I think, you know, we, you and I have talked a lot about this, that, you know, there's some, sometimes landscape architecture just like fills in all, all the blanks for you. And, you know, you don't have, a, there's no room for interpretation. And I think those, that's some of the really wonderful things about the Alnarp um, forest lab uh, as an example or just how we interact with forests like as we explore forests um, and that um, Elucida Lazenby experimental forest was also uh, kind of encompassed the idea of like interpret you know landscape and interpretation and that we don't need to you know drive the path right up to the stair and then you know show somebody where to go again so that it I think, yeah, we could give people more credit, you know? I think, you know, maybe Robin would agree. <laughs> Robin Winogrand? Yeah. Probably. I'm quite sure. I'm quite sure. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, but, but I mean, you know, you talked about surplus. You take something away, actually, and you, you get more <laughs> by, right. by taking something away. So it's the experience and you get, you get this kind of... Uh, object also in the in the garden which is super interesting um one thing that uh, you had the lecture also for the students in amsterdam and i saw they were mm -hmm. quite interested uh, if you can just quickly say what's the plan with the miyawaki uh, forest just a little bit maybe three minutes yeah more. the idea is um and this is something ben benjamin uh, hackenberger on our team has been exploring more um maybe just to give some more context is that as this, you know, we, we decided to work with this um, Miyawaki method on this project. We knew we wanted a collection, like a kind of dense collection of t forest as it, as it is like what's beyond the fence. Um, and, but in this case, we decided to plan it on this kind of half meter grid. Um, and the idea is that, you know, the, the trees will compete, uh, grow quickly to get to the light. Um, we'll lose some in the process. Um, so it's again like setting us, you know, setting a really clear baseline condition of the diversity and the grid, and then having that, you know, this project has several date, date, datums, like the stair is one, the Milwaukee planting is another, so that we can, you know, observe that change, um, ob observe the change over time. Um, you know, let's see which species win. Um, even this spring, I, I cut some of the cremali. They were just bothering me that they were so tall. <laughs> but, and they've like really leafed out. Um, and so we were also working on, like as this is a sort of test patch, um, we're working with a, a, local, um, a local group in Rostavi called Napirze. They're going to try to reforest a floodplain on the Mtwari River. So they're going to try to adapt some of these ideas. Uh, again, ideas of increasing the edge, edge conditions a little bit more than a typical Milwaukee planting. Um, and then possibly as we work more into this BLC urban forest project, but also I think for some of the larger development projects that we might be involved in, um, I really hope that this is a way to work you know, economically um, like, for example, gets, in the yeah. um, the reforestation in the in the Belize. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. There's um, <clears throat> yeah. If that for the the reforestation of the Belize urban forest, we didn't use Miyawaki, the Miyawaki method. Yeah, yeah. We were, we didn't quite have enough control over that. Mm. We had some traditional foresters. 
<laughs> but in that case, we use nur- at least we use nurse plants around uh, each of the plantings, which kind of does a similar thing. Mm-hmm. And uh, this fence was there uh, before you came, huh? Yeah, and there's yeah. a couple of like very stunted linden trees, I think, along mm. the edge. <laughs> mm. So, so basically, it's also yeah. because you said that these are still some active pastures around. So yeah. it's also kind of a, you know, um, you have to keep the cows out or cows or sheep. You, it's cows, and actually, cows. one day uh-huh. they, I didn't, I didn't like double the wire, and they got they okay, they can open the gate. <laughs> Vano told me they could open the gate, and they, okay. all of a sudden I heard the bells. <laughs> mm. You know, I was sitting there looking at butterflies and bees and, like, the whole pollinator <laughs> scene, and um, then the cows showed up, and I had to chase them out. No, but it gives the project kind of a... It takes it further in terms of uh, this public-private kind of... Mm-hmm. Uh, another layer the, over, over the whole concept. I guess. Yeah, nice. It's it's a weird splice, right? Because it's like cut out of the pasture, but then it's it's you know, the forest has jumped into mm-hmm. the suburb again. And then you so, have the opening in the forest, which is a kind of yeah. <laughs> yin yang situation. No, and then it's not bad. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I know, there's a lot going on. There, there's a lot going on with so little, and that's why it's like, ah, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> that's usually what I say. When I come visit, I'm like, oh, yeah. because it is, um, I mean, it's like Arsenal and that there's there's just things that we've left open and we're always surprised by. And, you know, we have some disappointments from time to time, like, you know, whether it's the you know, the situation with the concrete or like mm. <laughs> the situation with like, there's all this, you know, uh, radish. And we did end up pulling a lot of that out, but I guess the radish is supposed to be good for like soil aeration, but okay. anyway, there's, yeah, but you know, we don't like, there's, I guess there's ways of like maintaining it that are uh, more generative, I guess, rather than like restrictive And I, mm. you know, I think if we had, yeah, maybe, maybe in the coming year we'll get to do something again for the architecture biennial and maybe get some okay. more money to like play around with that some more and make other things happen or at least document it more clearly. But, oh yeah. And then we also got nominated for an EU Mies prize Yay. for this. <laughs> Yay. Congratulations. So that got... Yeah, that got announced. With uh, this one? Uh, wait, wait, with this one? Britannia. Britannia. Yeah, 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 yeah. And um, the Tbilisi Urban Forest. Oh, so no, it's great. So George, mm. George is going to the EU as only with two landscape projects that are about biodiversity um, and no, nothing really built except the stair, which is the first time. George has always, you know, done, like, buildings or maybe a skate mm. park. But... <laughs> This is the first time it's just, it's just brutal. <laughs> and the house is, yeah. the house is, um, it's also an Airbnb. So uh, mm-hmm. we've, we've done our retreats there, um, which has been great. So, you know, we want to like take a, take a day and work out some things related to uh, the studio and... It's a great environment so too. So basically, to uh, everyone who is uh, watching this can book, book. Uh, yeah, the, it's cool. Oh, that's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think in the, I, th- I think right now they have a long term tenant because it's really hard for them to rent it in the winter. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 for sure. <laughs> it's hard to get in and out, but um, no, it's got, it's got great, great air and um, obviously the atmosphere show always going on, and. I think the owner's mother has uh, bought some land down the street, so there might be another. Another one, phase two. Yeah, yeah, phase two. Okay, so right. I, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Mm-hmm.